Hey, little sister, what's the worst show ever? That gets my goat. I remember when I was in college, there was this guy that was a real smart ass that would, had his own forum or something like every Tuesday in the school paper, he would have some silly rant about things and people would say, oh, you must love that column. You must love that. And it really bothered me. And then, and then you know, when I talk to people and they find out that I'm a dork or whatever, they'll be like, oh, you must love Napoleon Dynamite then. Or they're like, oh, you're such a fucking idiot. You must love Big Bang Theory. And it's like, no, do black people love minstrel shows? <laughs> no, but because you work in news, I'm wondering, have you had people say, well, then you must love the newsroom. I haven't had that asked of me yet. I, is this a new show? It is. It's a new Aaron Sorkin show that just started. And like the buzz is really, really big. And I saw the pilot today the, the pilot the first episode it's an hbo show but to drum up interest they put it like on youtube you can go to hbo.com you can go to the newsroom.com or whatever and you can watch the whole episode for free and it's about uh jeff daniels is a news anchor like a tom brokaw kind of guy mm -hmm. who has you would almost say like a nervous breakdown at the very beginning of the episode he used to have a lot of principles. He used to want to be like a Walter Cronkite kind of newsman. But he found out in being a professional that you don't want to appear too far on the right or too far on the left. You don't want to be outspoken about your views or whatever because you want ratings, because you want people to like you. And so he's become more and more and more vanilla. And at the very beginning of the episode, somebody asks him, well, how come you always appear, you know, middle of the road? What do you really think about something? And he's like, no, I, I, all I like is football. And that's, that's what I get really passionate about. And they're like, no, 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 you answer the question. And he just snaps and he goes on a rant and he talks about what used to be great about America and what's sucks about America now. And he says, this is the worst period, generation period ever, period. And he just goes on and on and on about America used to be the greatest nation on the earth and it isn't anymore. And this is why. And he goes on and on. And the people are just aghast and horrified. And it's in front of a college that he's giving this speech. And so many people are like getting their phones out and are recording this. I mean, it's going live on the internet as he speaks. And when he finally stops, you know, there's just silence. Nobody applauds. Nobody does anything. And then, and then they're just like, well, we'd like to thank our speakers. And he just leaves. And anyway, he gets put on leave because he claims that he was taking vertigo medicine and it affected him. And he has no memory of what he said and all that. And the, the rest of the show takes place on his first day back at work. And in the interim, like his team has all gone on to other things They've all been promoted or swapped out. To, and and his, uh, the guy that he was grooming to be like an anchor or whatever has his own show at 10 o'clock now. And all the people that used to work with Jeff Daniels now work with this guy. And so he meets with this new team that gets brought in. And he, he, basically the, the head of the news division, his producer or whatever, has set him up with like a new – I see, I don't know what, what the positions are, but like a new executive producer and a new writer and a new this and a new researcher and all that stuff to put him in his place. And this day happens to be the day that the BP oil spill happens. So they go live and, and they – do the whole hour of his NBC News broadcast about the BP oil spill, whereas all the other networks are doing other less important topics because they like, – anyway, I, I don't know why I'm over-explaining it, but <laughs> I cried through about half of this show. It was so moving to me and so like – I, in awe, because he talks about the coverage of the moon and the, and the coverage of JFK's assassination. These people, they told America how to feel and they told America what was important or whatever. And we looked up at them. And today our heroes are Kim Kardashian and, and things like that. Snooky. Yeah. And, you know, that he used to want to be that guy and he didn't anymore. And by the end of the episode, they like make their best hour of news ever. He gets a glimpse of that person that he used to be, and he realizes that the head of the news department specifically got all these people that would question him and stick him in the butt or whatever so that he would become what he had the potential to be and had slacked off forever about. 
then it ends and it's like you can catch up next week you know find out and but anyway there's so much like in fighting office politics and, and bickering and this and what if somebody sues us because we say this and what about our ratings and what are the 18 to 30 and they're just going on and on and then and also it's a live hour you know that he goes and they're just getting these calls and they put people on the phone and people don't know what to say and he doesn't know how to respond. It's such new news that they didn't have time to type up anything. And so on the teleprompter, it says vamp. And that's it. It says his name and then vamp. And then at the end, it says, good evening. This is, you know, whatever thing. Anyhow, I was briefly part of the news, part of the live news. And I just ate this thing up. And I think I still would have eaten it up had I not been part of the news because you know, Aaron Sorkin writes things, these shows where you just, you know, because like the West Wing, people felt like they saw what it was like to be in the presidential cabinet and all that stuff, even if they didn't work in Washington. Anyhow, you have not heard of this show? I haven't. I'm somewhat interested in seeing it. Although because I work in the news, I kind of avoid the news. And see, that's the thing that I thought about you is that maybe you wouldn't watch this. Maybe it would be unpleasant for you. The Devil Wears Prada, everybody loved that movie. I didn't. I couldn't watch it because I worked in an entertainment office with a monstrous of a boss, the worst person I met in L.A. And I had my car stolen. I had my apartment broken into. I worked on the Gilmore Girls. And she was the worst person that I worked with. And so all the things that happened to Anne Hathaway, I didn't think were funny. I thought they were horrible and so familiar. And I just, oh, I probably should have been crying through The Devil Wears Prada. I didn't. <laughs> you oh. didn't? No, I didn't. Oh, I cried the whole time. Well, I cried because they kept calling her fat. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> but anyhow, we've talked about that. There have been shows or movies about what you do and what I have done. And it drives me crazy when, like, there'll be an extra and he has to memorize his lines and stuff like that in a movie about a movie. And I'll be like, you of everybody should know how movies are made because you're making a movie. I'm too close to it. I can't enjoy that. And I think right. I've told you about Jeff. He can't enjoy anything about spies or about killing brown people, you know, about how computers work. <laughs> and you, uh, there was that show Pepper Dennis, and you couldn't stand the way that they pretended that a newsroom worked. But I did work briefly on live news, and I remember... And it only happened one or three times when something huge two. happened. But like Saddam Hussein, his execution happened while I was working there. And I, we had the footage of him hanging. And the, the decision was, well, what do we show? What do we black out? What do you know, kind of thing. But all of us had it in front of us. And I was just like, wow, that's an interesting situation where the producer or executive producer or director or somebody had to make this decision. And each network has its own person making that decision. And it's right. like, and, and, and the whole ratings thing bugged the fudge out of me when I found out that they cared so much about what a 13-year-old girl thought. Because a 13-year-old girl shouldn't be watching the news anyway. But they cared. And so it was like, well, what if the other network shows the hanging body? And so everybody goes to that other network and they get the ratings because we declined to show it. And I just like, wow, I never even thought that that would. Anyway, there were two or three of those moments in there where it's like, OK, we got to interrupt what we're normally doing and show this. And what do we interrupt? And, and, and that was also so interesting because the powers that be on this show were saying, well, all, some of this stuff is unconfirmed. We don't know that BP screwed up. We don't know that millions of gallons of oil are going, you know, some people are saying that this is going to be the worst environmental disaster of all time. Do we say that on the air? Wait, that's not confirmed. What, you know, and they were just so afraid. And so it basically came down to his executive producer and him, what they were going to say. And they decided to say, allegedly. They didn't. And that was <laughs> the point was he didn't play it safe because he had somebody in the booth that wouldn't let him play it safe. In the past, there had been people where he would have somebody in an interview situation and he would just pull his punches. He wouldn't put him in an uncomfortable position and all that because he didn't want to rock the boat. And now some, suddenly somebody was saying, don't let him off the hook. 
you know, in his ear and that, and anyhow, I, I know I'm just, I'm talking and talking and talking, but you didn't see the show. And I was hoping that you had heard <laughs> or that was somebody at work that said, have you seen the show? It's such BS. Or they'd be like, oh my gosh, that's just like what we do every day talking about the construction on the freeway or well, you know, whatever fascinating story <laughs> happens to happen right now. Wildfires, sir. <laughs> that's the fascinating story going on now, as you may recall from previous episodes. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, it's funny because sometimes people are into that kind of stuff because it's what they do and sometimes it's not. I remember one time years ago at my uh, previous station that I worked at, you know, it was one of those deals where it was a last minute thing and we had to run the tape up the hallway and give it to the person so they could play it at the last second. It just barely made it on air in time. And then she came back down and she said, oh, yeah, there you go. I got my my scene in broadcast news. Uh, you know, you remember that movie that came out 25 years, 30 years ago. I think that was like the big show for TV news forever. And so I don't know how many people watched that and were inspired to become the stupid anchor guy or what. But yeah, I don't know. I saw that movie and was not interested in it at all. You saw it while you were working for the news? No, or? I saw it when I was young kid, okay. and was not inspired by it. Still wound up in news somehow. Well, the, the, the thing is, not every day is going to be like the oil spill. Right. But if you work at it long enough, one of these things is going to happen. Yeah. Something huge is going to happen. There have to have been moments where you were at work and breaking news, you know, fill in the blank, whatever it is. I mean, I don't know. Do you have any experiences where you're just like, this was my best. This was the day that it was most exciting, most amazing to work in. And again, I hate that it's live on the show, on the newsroom. It's all exciting and wow, anything can happen. And you remember the old show Network where he says, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore or whatever. That. The whole big deal was that was going out live and the producers are like, oh, do we cut the feed? Do we go to commercial? What do we do? But the things that he's saying are already being heard by millions of people. And I, it never, I never understood why local news had to be live. Because every mistake I made or got, <laughs> I got blamed for was out there and you couldn't do a second take. You couldn't fix it. You couldn't take it back. Uh -huh. And just, you know, me pressing A instead of C or whatever was enough to derail the show. And yeah, I don't, I don't know if we even want to go into that. How many times you derailed the show or? <laughs> well, whether I derailed the show, whether I had any business doing what I did. It's too bad you didn't work there now because we're much more automated and it's much harder to derail the show. Everything used to be blamed on us back in those days when you were still there. But uh, these days it's not nearly as much. You'd, you'd probably uh, still be there now if you just started later. But, but I remember there was one time that I had edited something and it didn't match the script so they went live to the reporter and she was still waiting for the script to match up whatever her cue was and it didn't happen and she oh she ripped my head off afterward and it wasn't it had been left off the page or it was on the next page or something like that there was an explanation it wasn't something i had done out of spite you know you know it was just one of those moments where she had felt embarrassed for one second that nobody noticed but, you know, it was my fault. And you defended me. And I thought that that was really cool. You actually said, F you. And I thought that that was just, <laughs> I was like, wow. But the, the thing is, why, why does it have to be live? What if somebody shows their tits in the background? <laughs> or what if somebody sneezes and there's a big long booger on the, their top lip for a whole story? Why does it have to be live? I don't know. I think the uh, idea is that it's happening now as opposed to a newspaper which comes out the next day it's, it's going on now and that's the uh, thing that twitter and newer forms of news you know your your newspaper now has a website where they'll publish stories right away as soon as they're written they don't wait for the 6:30 show or whatever they just do it now and that's kind of the driving force i remember when i first started in news 10 years ago we had a big cnn poster on the wall in one of the edit bays or something like that. And it said, every news story has the same deadline now. And, you know, that's kind of 
the thing, you know, so many stations are, you know, we're first. When the news happens, we're there first. Well, I see, I remember there was a particular producer, and the producers write the stories, that couldn't spell anything. <laughs> Their spelling was always terrible. And I had been there three weeks or a month or something like that. So I was still, well, by the end, I was still pussyfooting around or whatever. But she had spelled something so wrong on the copy, on the, on the, what do you call it? On the script that when the live news went, and it wasn't the live news, it was uh, coming up at six. Uh-huh, you know, like the, a tease. The, the, during commercials, they would have live promos for the news later. But anyway, the word was so mangled that the anchor went, uh, you know, reading and then ad-libbing what they thought it meant. And from that point on, I was like, oh, well, I should probably fix some of these typos and that, which I probably wasn't supposed to do. But it's, I mean, like somebody that lowly (laughs) should notice things like that. But it was one of those, if that hadn't been live, if they'd been, and sometimes they would record the promos, the commercials or whatever, 10 minutes early or 15 minutes early, an hour early so that they'd have them to go. And they're still timely. They're Mm -hmm. still almost live or whatever, but you could have done that over again when the, the anchor stumbled uh, anyhow, it just there's there's two things about the show. One is you know the live news aspect, the the, the ability to tell people the truth or to tell people how important something is, which is a big deal about the news. And the other thing is just like the politics and what goes on in the world and standing up for what you believe in and drama or mm-hmm. drama, as your wife would say. And so to me, it worked on two levels. Yeah, my wife was in the drama club once. I'm divorced from it. I'm 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 away from the live news experience enough that I mean it looked totally real to me. And I found out later that they actually do all that stuff live and they have several cameras set up in different places filming it. So when somebody's pretending to talk to somebody else, they're actually talking to them. And when she's in the control room and saying, Okay, we've got some new news there. Rachel is bringing it in to hand it to you. He hears that and they're filming that. And it's just like, why would you ever do that? But it's just so they can get that adrenaline rush, I guess, of this is what it is. Or so, or so they, that it they, looks more real. They shot that show actually live as though it was a live show then, huh? No, it probably takes eight days to shoot that show. But the production of the news aspect of the show, they try and shoot as it's really happening and there's no post and there's no, uh, so for the immediacy, uh, so that it comes across as my, I I don't know. It's like why an actor wants to do his own stunt Uh for some reason like that. Anyhow, I, I friggin loved it, but I friggin loved the one that was about Saturday Night Live and I friggin loved. Did you like the one that was about sports Sports, center? I, I didn't see the one about sports center and I felt like, it would have nothing to offer me because I am not into that. But now I'm thinking, whoops, I probably should have given that a chance because it's not just about a show about sports. It's about people and conflict within that. Right. There, were, there was so much conflict and there was so much politics and there was so, just in the little bit that I saw of what goes into the news that I don't know, maybe it's too real for you. Maybe it's like Devil Wears Prada for me. <laughs> just be like, no, you know, that's not entertainment. That's what I do every yeah, single day. Yeah, it could be. I might watch that and just go, no, turn it off. I'm at home, not at work. Make it stop. <laughs> I don't know why. I, I, I was hoping this it's... would go somewhere because <laughs> I was hoping that you had said, oh, the people at work, blank. Said this. And yeah, I haven't heard anybody talking about it, I don't think. People don't like me at work. I have no friends. They don't talk to me. They just spit on me when I walk by. Suddenly I'm flashing back to when I worked there. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I, I wonder. Actually. When um, when did it air? Was it a few weeks ago or has it been a while? Or I'm wanting to say May, but it might have been a June show. Uh, so it's it's really recently. Huh. Somebody may have mentioned, you know, I think I vaguely recall maybe some mention of it, but not really. Nothing that I can remember enough to comment on. I wonder if it might be like one of those dreams that you have where you dream that you're at work. And then you wake up and you're completely unrefreshed and you're like, oh, crap, now it's time to go to work. Oh, geez. Do you do that? (laughs) Do you have dreams where you're like, okay, this is the rundown. These all these stories that I have to edit and you're editing. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. I mean, mean, you would think that you would have dreams like that all the time because, I mean, you go to work five days a week, eight hours a day. 
So a majority of your time, the only thing you do more in a week is sleep because you do it seven days. Usually you probably don't even get eight hours a day for most people. So maybe you don't even manage to do it more in a week. I don't know. But yeah, I mean, it's it's one of those things. And I've been having all sorts of weird freaking dreams, man. I had this dream last night. Let me guess. L. McPherson's body, centipede head. No, it was Cy Snoodles. <laughs> um, <laughs> no, yeah, it was a weird dream. I had this dream that I was on the set of Game of Thrones TV show. Okay. And I was like an extra or something on the set of the Game of Thrones. But on the Game of Thrones TV show, instead of doing the TV show that day, they were doing a photo shoot, like a promotional photo shoot of the Game of Thrones characters. But (laughs) instead of having the actual Game of Thrones characters people there, they had a bunch of hot models And they were going to take pictures of these hot models and then like Photoshop the faces of the actors over them later. I'm sure that sort of thing happens. (laughs) It probably does. Because, uh, I don't know, I mean, you've told me about the skit that they did on Saturday Night Live about the Game of Thrones with like the 13-year-old boy was like, oh, okay, now you take off your shirt now. And hold on, I got to go to the bathroom. (laughs) Yes, he did. Uh, uh, There was going to be a photo where all these hot chicks were naked and they were still gonna photoshop the people's faces on and like the whole time like the extras were trying to pick up on the hot models it was just a weird dream oh and also the game of thrones was not written by george rr martin but it was written by some woman and (laughs) the hot model chick that i was trying to pick up on was the one that was going to be photoshopped with the author's face (laughs) it was just a weird dream and it was like i can't remember the rest of them but it was like the end of a string of like five or six dreams what just like a stream of consciousness thing from dream to dream i think with a baby i get woke up probably several times a night so you know it was like i was having a weird dream i wake up for a second i roll over go back to sleep and it starts into a new weird dream and i was having a bunch of them and at the time i was remembering them but by the time i wake up in the morning only the George R. R. Martin one remains. <laughs> it's weird when you have a dream that's so unlike reality and you're just like, how could I just make my way through that without going, no, this is a dream. You know what I mean? I don't know if you've ever had that happen to you where you're having a dream and you realize, oh, I'm having a dream, aren't I? Yeah, and then you're like, oh, what can I do in my dream? Can I do something cool? Can I make something happen? But most of the time... I just accept it. Yeah, that these you things do. are happening. And it's in retrospect where I'm like, well, how would I be on a space shuttle launch with no training? I mean, come on. How could you just be there and be expected to get on the space shuttle? Come yeah, on. it was like the dream. I had a dream uh, like a month ago or less where I was in a zombie apocalypse. <laughs> And I was, that was no dream. I was in this town that was like had a big fence all the way around it. You know, where they'd walled it off to keep the zombies out. And they ha- I was going through this place and they had like a little schoolhouse. And I went by and the kids were in there still learning, you know, despite the... Uh, and I was like impressed. Wow, these people are really keeping it together. They're even teaching their kids in the middle of the zombie apocalypse. Wow. I was there. It was like me and some girl were making our way through the zombie apocalypse. And, and I just... After waking up, I'm just like, how would I just think that... How would I go along with this zombie apocalypse dream without realizing, no, this is just like a movie in my head. Why am I... It's strange that that kind of thing can happen. You can just accept it and go on with it, but it does. Okay, well, this has been really strange, just talking. We did kind of derail a little at um, some point there, too. Two things. I recommend that people watch this show, The The Newsroom. Uh-huh. It fits into my sensibilities a little bit more than maybe somebody in Kansas. That's me shrugging. Uh, and two, the episode was probably nothing like how I described it. <laughs> I don't know what's wrong with me that I can't just say how the show was, that my mind goes, and then this happened. I was like, no, no, it didn't. It didn't. I'm like, oh, shoot, what do I say now? Uh <laughs> I don't know why that. You used to do that a lot to me, too. You would would tell me about a comic book that you'd read. And then you're like, oh, yeah, hey, I bought that comic book for you. And I'd get it and I'd read it. And I was like, 
he said this other thing happened this, no this isn't how what so I get like a two tellings of the story. It's kind of interesting. It's like a broken mirror. <laughs> Your retelling of the comic book and the real telling of the comic book. But uh, whatever. Well, it's all good. Well, it would be neat if at one point you threw down the comic and you're like, this isn't as good. There have been times where I thought that. Where I thought, oh, I like the way Rish told me about it better. I don't know. Oh, well. Well, it, if you do watch that show, if because just go to YouTube and, uh-huh. and watch the first episode if you sure. want. Check. It would be fun to just get on here and and ask you how you went, what you thought. All right, I'll consider that. Maybe people should donate. <laughs> Maybe we should ask for a forty dollar donation so that I'll sit through this show on the D box chair <laughs> <laughs> and we'll make a special episode out of it. No, I'll just watch it. All right, folks, thanks for listening. Bye. Uh, see ya. That gets my go is produced under a Creative Commons 3.0 license. Apparently, the creative in Creative Commons doesn't mean anything. <laughs>